Pence from Organic Chemistry. Thank you. We've had a wonderful year, and we hope you have a great summer. But before you go, we'd like to teach you how to blow some things up. TNT was first synthesized in 1863 by a German chemist named Joseph Wilbrand, who had been working on the production of yellow dyes. Because TNT was only intended to be used as a dye, it took nearly 20 years to discover that it was a powerful explosive. TNT's explosive properties were not obvious because of how difficult it is to detonate. Eventually, its hidden properties were discovered by another German chemist named Karl Hossermann in 1891. During this time period, Germany was also leading the world in chemical research, although TNT's chemical applications would soon be used for other reasons. After recognizing TNT's hidden explosive property, German armed forces began using it in 1902 for military purposes, and in particular during World War I. TNT offered several advantages to other explosives. One of these advantages was the fact that TNT is difficult to detonate, so it was safer to handle. Because TNT also has a low melting point of 80 degrees Celsius, it was also used to fill artillery shells. These TNT-filled shells are more likely to penetrate before exploding, which caused heavy damage to opponents and gave an upper hand to Germany during World War I. Lastly, TNT produces high-velocity shockwaves, providing an additional warfare advantage. One of the side effects of TNT is that it turns the skin yellow. This side effect was common among women who worked in TNT factories during World War I, and unfortunately, about 400 women are estimated to have lost their lives as a result of exposure to TNT during the war. The side effects of TNT became increasingly more prevalent after the U.S. began to mass-produce it in 1916. In the U.S. alone, more than 17,000 cases of TNT poisoning were reported during World War I, and over 500 munition workers died due to liver damage and anemia. From 1930 to 1940, the Department of Defense military plans demilitarized obsolete munitions and made large quantities of TNT, resulting in high levels of soil and groundwater contamination. This generated significant amounts of explosives contaminated wastewaters, which was discharged into lakes, rivers, and lagoons. Although TNT is still widely used in the U.S. military, its manufacturing impurities presents a wide array of health and environmental concerns. So how do we synthesize TNT? What's the starting material? Where do we begin? You can actually buy the starting material, Tolly Green, online at sciencecompany.com for the low price of $36.95. But what if you don't have Tolly Green? That's no problem. Based on what we've learned in class, we can go through an electrophilic aromatic substitution on a benzene ring to get us started. All we need to do is add an aldehyde, reduce the aldehyde, and then voila, you have toluene. But what if you forget to reduce the aldehyde first? We should probably go into some discussion about electron withdrawing and electron donating groups. We have to consider these effects of those that donate electron density or withdraw electron density away from our benzene ring. If we do not reduce the aldehyde, we have a withdrawing group. After reduced, the alkyl group is a donating group. So electron donating groups, as we know, act as ortho directors, which is what we're seeking when we're performing our first nitration on our benzene ring. Electron withdrawing groups act as meta directors, which is what we're looking to avoid. Here we have a summary of the activators, which are our donating groups, which act as ortho directors. You can see in the top right, that would be our alkyl substituent, versus the deactivators at the bottom, which act as electron withdrawing groups, and you'll see our nitro group in the bottom left corner. In order to add the aldehyde to the ring, we first need to take carbon monoxide and the protonate hydrochloric acid to create our four-mile cation. We then create a complex with aluminum trichloride, which further creates another four-mile cation that adds to the benzene ring and eventually gives us our benzaldehyde product. In order to reduce that carbonyl, we again deprotonate hydrochloric acid, which creates a complex between zinc and chlorine. Now, there are competing schools of thought about how exactly the Clemenson reduction is executed. We've chosen to demonstrate the carb anionic form. However, there is also a carbonide mechanism that uses the radicals on the surface of the zinc to eventually create, or after multiple protonations, our toluene that you see in the top right corner. So now we need to add our first nitro group. But well, let's talk about it. Why is the nitro group electron withdrawing? Well, the key word is, of course, resonance. As you can see from these structures here below, we pass around the positive charge and eventually have it on the nitrogen atom itself. These resonance structures here contribute significantly to the resonance hybrid. So we want to add our nitro group. How do we do that? We need to make some nitronium ions. We'll mix sulfuric acid and nitric acid, which will interact to form our nitronium ion. As you can see below, the nitric acid will deprotonate sulfuric acid, and in the second step, water will leave. 
This will leave our nitronium ion, which is heavily positively charged, and is known as a super-duper electron sucker, which will swing double toluene to share some electrons with it. In order to create TNT, we go through three different substitutions where we add a nitro group. There are a couple of different ways science says this can be done, but from what we have learned, we choose to add a nitro group through the nitronium ion. As the resonance structures show on the bottom right corner, the benzene ring is able to delocalize the positive charge, and then water deprotonates the hydrogen that is attached adjacent to the nitro group to re-aromatize the ring and give us our para-substituted nitro group on the toluene ring. We then do our dye substitution in accordance to what we learned, where the meta position or the ortho position is subsequently um, added to with the nitro group. Again, through the nitrodium ion, as the resonance structures demonstrate, the ring is able to delocalize the positive charge and then re aromatization is, is achieved upon deprotonation of the hydrogen via water. We could also perform a dye substitution by adding to the um, sixth position so that both of the ortho positions are occupied. Similarly, uh, this again would create a 2,6 dye substituted product, which is performed through the same steps with the nitronium ion that eventually leads us to create what we're trying, the explosive we're trying to build here. The 2,4,6 tri substituted product known as TNT is also achieved through the nitronium ion, where this time there are less positions available. Uh, and so the, nit the nitro group then will go to the remaining ortho position, leaving us with the TNT product at the end and a little bit of hydronium left over. If we look at the HNMR, we see there are only two peaks in our final product. Our two protons that are uh, attached to the benzene ring are in the same chemical environment, but they are shifted very far downfield due to the nitro groups. And then we see a singlet over here that would constitute three hydrogens from our methyl group at the top of the ring. If we look at the IR spectroscopy done with the KBR disc, at first we might see what we think is an alcohol peak, but this is a, um, a consequence of using KBR versus CCL4 when conducting IR spectroscopy. We do see a little bit of CH2 and CH3 stretching in the 3100 to 2900 region, and then these very pronounced peaks correspond with our nitro groups that have been added to the ring. So talking a little bit about the environmental implications of TNT. TNT can be released to the environment through spills, the firing or demilitarization of munitions, the disposal of ordinances, leaching from poorly sealed impoundments, or from manufacturing and munitions and processing facilities. Um, from there, it can pollute water, soil, and the atmosphere at large, um, which affects aquatic and coastal life. It's highly toxic to terrestrial plants, affecting germination rates, um, decreasing plant biomass, and leading to abnormal growth. Um, in 2001, uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency declared the removal of TNT co contamination a priority, um, and TNT was identified at over 30 sites on the EPA national priorities list in 2013. Um, pink and red water are two of the largest concerns. Next slide. Um, so pink and red water are two distinct types of wastewater uh, caused by TNT contamination. Pink water is produced from um, equipment washing processes, after um, munitions filling or demilitarization operations, um, and its color can be attributed to the photolysis of dissolved TNT and the collection of complex dye-like molecules. Um, red water, which is also known as cellate water, is um, produced during the process used to purify crude TNT, um, and it has a complex composition containing many aromatic compounds as well as inorganic salts. Next slide. So what makes TNT so special? Um, why was its use so popular compared to other um, explosives? Um, well, compared to more sensitive explosives like nitroglycerin, TNT is rather insensitive to shock and friction, which decreases the risk of its accidental detonation. TNT actually requires a pressure wave from an explosive booster or starter explosion um, in order to detonate. Um, it has a low melting point um, of 80 degrees Celsius, um, which is much below the temperature at which TNT would spontaneously detonate. Um, and this low melting point permits its safe pouring or combination with other explosives. Um, and finally, its hydrophobic character ins ensures its effective use in wet environments. Next slide. So we're going to look a little bit at the history of TNT-related health outcomes um, in relation to TNT usage. Um, so if we look at the graph and we follow the 
um, line that is marketed by circles, um, that represents the um, numbers of health defects. Um, the other line, the, the darker blue line, represents TMT usage. So we see that from the start of TMT use until World War One, there was a spike in TMT usage. It was also correlated with a spike in TMT um, health TNT-related health defects. Um, by World War II, even though the usage of TNT um, still continued to increase, there began to be a decrease in some of the health defects. And by post-World War II afterwards, um, even though TNT usage still began um, continued to increase, there was a sharp decrease in health defects. Um, until today, there is still continuously a um, decrease of health defects, which also relate now to um, less TNT usage. So let's try to understand why this trend um, might have occurred when TNT usage still began to, still was increasing, but the health defects decreased. Next slide, please. So potential exposure um, uh, to TNT could occur by inhalation, ingestion, or dermal contact. So the decrease of adverse health effects that we saw in the last slide um, is primarily the result of protective measures for ammunition workers, such as protective clothing, a change of contaminated clothes, use of indicator soap, and mandatory bathing, as well as the improvement of ammunition plant ventilation systems. Yet TNT has been found, as Danielle had mentioned before, in more than 30 sites on the EPA national priorities list. And those sites have been deemed as either potential or actual sources of human exposure. And we know that exposure to TNT may cause negative health outcomes. So this is a really important thing to be learning about. Let's talk a lot now about specific health impacts TNT exposure might actually have. So TNT exposure primarily damages the liver and causes disorders of the blood, such as anemia. Exposure of humans to TNT has also been associated with respiratory complications, dermatitis, and development of cataracts. Additionally, studies on animal exposure have shown possible associations with enlargement of the spleen, as well as harmful effects on the immune system and male reprodu reproductive system. Urinary bladder carcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma have been reported and have caused the EPA to actually classify TNT as a group C possible human carcinogen. Um, one final study shows an association between increased rates of some types of leukemia and living in a town near TNT munition plants. Next slide, please. So how can we identify or quantify exposure to TNT? During the two world wars, and especially during World War I, jaundice was one of the main indicators of TNT intoxication. Now, detection of TNT in the blood or urine is often an indication of recent dermal, oral, or inhalation exposure. Another early sign of TNT exposure is the change of urine color um, that can range in humans from abnormal amber to deep red. What can we do about it? Vast sites worldwide are contaminated with TNT because of improper handling, processing, or disposal, and military activities. The toxicity and mutagenic effects of TNT have led environmental agencies to declare the removal of this pollutant a high priority. So let's speak about what is being done about it. Um, so the first way is by detecting TNT. Um, detecting TNT will help identify contaminated sites that people should avoid. High-performance liquid chromatography, high-resolution gas chromatography, and capillary column gas chromatography have all been paired with several types of detectors, including mass spectrometry, spectrometry electrochemical detection, electron capture detectors, and ultraviolet detectors. Additionally, colorimetric screening methods have also been used to detect TNT in soil, water, and on surfaces. Next slide, please. Remediation is another way to help make those sites safe again. A number of methods have been devised to remediate TNT polluted soil and water. Currently, incineration is a very effective and widely used remediation alternative, but this method is expensive due to the costs of soil excavation, transport, and energy for incineration. So in response, in situ bioremediation um, is an emerging technology for treatment of groundwater that is contaminated with explosives and really addresses some of the concerns about the expenses. Um, some examples of in-situ bioremediation techniques that have been tested thus far um, include natural attenuation, bio-augmentation, composting, and phytoremediation. Next slide, please. Future applications. So TNT has been a standard explosive used in munitions for more than 100 years, as we've seen. Um, but the military is really looking to phase out its use due to its toxicity. A new 24-atom molecule has ignited the interest of chemists as a possible TNT replacement. This compound is known as bis-124-oxidiazole bismethylene dinitrate. Um, 
Because of all the issues that we've spoken about before, the U.S. military is developing a different munition that contains 2,4-dinitroanazole, or DNAN, which is less sensitive to explosive stimuli compared to TNT, and will hopefully offer improved environmental benefits. The addition of DNAN to an explosive formulation greatly reduces the risk of accidental detonations. The study suggests that DNAN and its metabolites are less toxic than TNT, and hence may pose a reduced environmental risk. However, TNT is still widely used in the U.S. military and presents various health and environmental concerns. We thank you all for your time. Should you try to synthesize this this summer, please be careful and report all problems and accidents to the chemistry department at Columbia University. Have a wonderful summer, and we hope to see you all soon in medical school. Thank you.